Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. Britons never will be slaves. What is it, Paul, that you don't like my song? I have decided that I am going to Africa and that is it. No, I don't want to go to Oxford or to Cambridge or to any of those universities. I want to help expand the spirit of the Pox Britannica. I want to build the railroad and get rid of all of those superstitions that are blocking industry. Father, I want to bring foreign capital and arts to the people. Father, we will be able to keep in touch, don't worry. With the invention of the telegraph system, I promise I will write letters. Well, if you have nothing else to say to me, then I guess this is goodbye. Son, was the Berlin Conference Act not enough for you? Was already having Arabia and India not enough for the British? Who told Britain that it was their duty to conquer and help the people of the world? What sort of diplomacy subjugates the natives for their own selfish interests? James, you are acting like the aristocrat who does what he pleases and grabs what he covets. And you are like the shopkeeper who pursues his purpose of industry and steadfastness with the greatest sense of moral and religious duty. And as the great champion of freedom, you conquer and you annex half the world and you call it colonization. The shop owner in Manchester has sent his goods to a new market, but he has sent you a missionary to teach the gospel of peace. In my day, manufacturing was the industrial revolution here in England. And you are going off to who knows where for a new market and raw materials. Mum and I will write to you. Goodbye, James. Dear Mom and Dad, I arrived in Africa today, in a place called Sudan. I'm beginning to work on the railroad, the Cape to Cairo railroad. 40,000 miles of a railroad track, can you believe it? We are calling it a development plan. I have come here to give peace to warring tribes, to administer justice where all was violent, to strike the chains off of the slave, to draw the richness from the soil, to plant the earliest seeds of commerce and learning, and to increase in whole peoples their capacity for pleasure and diminish capacities for pain and violence. Well, Father, what more of a beautiful British ideal is that? I have realized that I am an imperialist because I am, Brit and I am a British race patriot. It is not the soil of England that inspires my patriotism, but the spiritual heritage and the aspirations and the freedoms that keeps me going. Well, I'd better get back to the railroad now. James. Darling, what sort of rubbish is our son talking about? In 1852, Benjamin Disraeli said that the colonies were millstones round our neck. And now Benjamin Disraeli, along with Cecil Rhodes and Joseph Chamberlain, is advocating for imperialism. They say that it is a true and a wise economical policy. Oh, dear James. You should be happy to know that your favorite author, Sir Rudyard Kipling, wrote a poem especially for you. The White Man's Burden. Pshaw, the White Man's Burden, can you believe that? It read, take up the White Man's Burden. Send forth the best you breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. Well, I certainly have sent my son into exile now, haven't I? James, in all seriousness, I have begun to read in the newspapers that Sudan has come into a diplomatic conflict with France. Is Britain sticking its nose in someone else's business again? The newspapers are calling it a Fashoda crisis. Please write back and tell me. Dear Dad, the Fashoda crisis certainly is affecting my life. I have had to stop working on the Cape to Cairo Railroad. There's increased competition between us British, the French, and the Dutch. In South Africa, another Boer War is bubbling over. But Father, this was a diplomatic necessity that England come here. Our rivals were seizing and annexing similar, for similar economic purposes. What else were we to do with the surplus back in Britain? Were we supposed to have an imbalanced economy? But Father, on the other hand, people are becoming increasingly dependent upon us. I received command from my leader to enforce white standards of hygiene, decency, and morals. 
But I've also noticed that it's leading to the disintegration of primitive group standards, which might lead them to extermination. The lowest societies hold irrational beliefs and are not materialistically oriented. Oh, but Father, how can I say imperialism is wrong if I'm helping take people out of suffering? I do not seek foreign domination, but a power for good and a power for peace and a cooperative commonwealth. All for now, Father. James. Oh, darling. Where did we go wrong? James is starting to become conflicted. Just as the economist J.A. Hobson said, James, classic imperialists have an innate human need for power. They find an excitement and adventure in conquering the savage. Now, I hope that doesn't happen to you. This gangrene of colonial rowdyism is infecting us, and the habit of repression in liberty is in weak nations is endangering our own, like you, son. I hope that you come home soon. Mom and I just want you to be safe. Dear Dad, I can't lie about what it's really like. We have received command that we will be starting war against the Sudanese Mahdi people. They have fought back because we have imposed high taxes upon them. Father, do you remember when I learned in school that Sir Robert Seeley said that the expansion of empire could be acquired in the fit of an absence of mind? What I am living through is not the fit of an absence of mind. Stripping people of the native land, going to war? Father, do you remember when I used to run around the house screaming at the top of my lungs, rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. Britons never will be slaves. Father, I feel like a slave right now myself. I am done being the father to the native children. I am done expanding the economy for Britain. I just want to come home, Father. All for now, James. Well. James never did make it home. They sent him back in a body bag. Although the natives over there may have been backwards in technology, they were contented enough. And I tried telling that to James, but he wouldn't listen to me. And now he's gone. Just as George Bernard Shaw and the Fabians said, increased industrialization would lead to increased greed. And that has led to tensions between the major European powers. And now James is gone. The neighbors are calling him a hero for standing up for the things that Britain believes in. I just want my son. James, I know that you gave great service to the empire, but mom and dad will always love you. Ever since James is dead, the British Empire has become more racist and xenophobic and continues to nation build, whatever that means. With imperial symbols everywhere, I can't even have a damn smoke without being reminded that luxury items come from the Empire. Well, to hell with the Empire already! Pox Britannica. Um, I decided to use stock characters rather than um, historical figures because in my research when I was looking at historical figures I would want to stay historically accurate to their political ideals and if I were using their primary sources for my script I wanted to, you know, to, you know, to use their words in their character. Um, and so I used pro-imperialists such as Joseph Chamberlain, and I used J.A. Hobson, 
and I used George Bernard Shaw and the Fabians. Um, so because I was combining all of those, I decided that stock characters would be the best thing. Um, in terms of deciding to make this debate between a son and a father, and I decided to do that because it was more of a debate than just in, in the political life. It was in the social life, in sport, in the cadet forces, scouting movement, the press, the pulpit, you know? So they were somewhat brainwashing the kids, so I wanted it to be conflicting ideologies that was tearing a family apart. Um, and in terms of costuming, um, I decided to use um, the scarf um, to represent the duality of the characters. Um, I tucked it in for the father, it was more of a neckerchief, and then it was a scarf for the son. And um, that made it easier for transitioning, and also, it also, um, it brought the two characters together, but it also brought them apart. Um, it gave you a little more creativity, too. Yeah. Just reciting scripts that, you know, from one person you were allowed to develop your own a little more. Exactly. Um, so, I didn't want to have a narrator character because I just, I thought that that might make it a little choppier and break, up, break it up and take it out of the, you know, the magic of the show, of, of the art. Um, so I wanted the characters to tell the history um, from their own perspective rather than, you know, um, sort of an unbiased narrator character. Um, so that's how I decided to use um, the, the characters to tell their own stories using bias but also using historical fact. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what drew you to this particular topic? Um, so Initially, I had read The White Man's Burden in history class, and I was like, that's interesting, and then it came up again in science class, and so, because social Darwinism. Um, so that idea really intrigued me, and when I found out that the theme was debate and diplomacy, I thought that this topic um, really used both of those themes pretty well, because not only were different factions and government debating within each other, um, there was also debate, or diplomacy, because Britain and the other European powers were going into Africa, you know, during the scramble for Africa, and they were, you know, partitioning, and they decided together that they could just break it up, and that was a diplomatic decision that they had made without really consulting um, the Africans, and when they did consult, they were just figureheads, and they didn't actually have power because the British were, were um, you know, actually running government, they just had put you know, um, someone from the African government as a semblance of power. But. I noticed you focused on Sudan. I'm looking at your bibliography yeah. and noticing also that you were interested in Churchill's perspective on the Sudan. Yeah. So um, talk to me a little bit how you integrated that particular piece into this script. Okay. Um, well, actually, Churchill wrote a book, um, and he was in the Sudan fighting, and it was a, a primary account of his experience in Sudan. So when I found that, um, the whole, um, when James first arrives to Sudan, saying that he's there to, shed the ch to give opportunity to people and get rid of the violence and strip the chains off of the slave, that was actually all Churchill's words. So that was one example of how I implemented primary source into my script. Very nice. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about your fascination with Kipling as well, because he's, he's all through your bibliography. Yeah, um, so Kipling was kind of the driving force because um, that's what initially drove me to the topic, and because I realized that some people thought that Rudyard Kipling's poem was satirical, some people thought it was genuine, and so it's still really controversial today. So I had the opportunity to interview a professor at a local university, excuse me, and um, we discussed his book and the intricacies of Rudyard Kipling's poem and what was sort of a, what was the deeper meaning um, of the poem beyond the surface of just the language. Um, and one of the examples is your new caught sullen people have devil and half child. So they're comparing the natives to, you know, devils and animals and um, dehumanizing them. So that was um, something that really drew me to this 
uh, I tried to focus, another reason why I use the father and son, because I wanted to focus more on like the social implications of imperialism and how it affected you know, like lay people rather than only uh, high power government officials, which is typically who we read about in, um, in his history books, history um, um, classes. Um, so I wanted to you know, talk about more about the common people and the common man that got up and was drawn into the whole thing and was willing to risk his life for the empire. The power of the written word. Yeah, exactly. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.